Say what's cracking YouTube. It's your boy 16 of life and I'm back like I'm on a pro violation. Y'all down. Now for those of y'all that's new to my page. In 1994 I got arrested. I was eventually sentenced to 16 years plus life. And I served 24 years straight in the California prison system. During those times, I accumulated some good stories. I'm going to share one with y'all today. If you like this story, definitely be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and most importantly, hit that notification bell. That way, anytime I drop a story, you will be notified and you can hop on it whenever you're ready. Also, I rap. Do not get it twisted. The flow is nothing like Curtis Blow. Go to my YouTube place. Excuse me. Go to my YouTube playlist. Scroll down to gas stations. You will find a lot of my music there. I guess. Also, I got a song called Never Gave Me Therapy. It's on all major streaming sites. Check that out. You're going to be impressed. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I did a story called They Tried to Rob My Homeboy for His Cell Phone. Now, in that story, uh, some dudes pushed up on one of my homies, tried to take his cell phone. Uh, the homie was adamant about he was going back for revenge. He, he said, you know, uh, wasn't no talking about... Wasn't no talking him up out of that decision. He had made it up in his mind. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. He just kept repeating that sentence. I'm going, I'm going. Okay, so if that's what you really want to do, I'm going to go down here. I'm going to make these knives. I'm going to put a handle on it. Meet me out here in an hour, and I'm going to give you these knives, and you go handle your business. So me and another homie named Money, we go to make the knives. We come back. The dude is nowhere to be be found. I go up to his cell. The dude is asleep, man. So uh, I'm going, I'm going to bed is what he was really talking about. So because of that situation right there, I chose just to start separating myself from uh, the homies. Now, when I say the homies, I'm talking about the homies from the Inland Empire, uh, also known as the IE. Like I always say, the Inland Empire consists of two counties, Riverside County and San Bernardino County. And all those cities within make up the Inland Empire. I think I counted earlier. It was something like 56, 57 cities. No, it was like 62 cities. So at any given moment, we can have a homie or two from any of those cities that make up the Inland Empire. So um, like I said, I might be down here in Bannon and I got a homie from maybe three or four hours away. But due to our geographical location, we're considered homies. But I ain't never seen this dude before in my life. This dude might like might be 70, 80 miles away from me. And so uh, later on, now when I first hit the pen, the homies in the Inland Empire, the car was extremely tight. It was a lot of love being shown, so on and so forth. Um, later on, I would say around the early maybe 2000s. Uh, maybe 2010, maybe even, you know, you had a lot of new gangs forming in the Inland Empire. And those youngsters from those gangs was coming to prison with a different type of uh, ideology about gang, gang banging, loyalty, so on and so forth. You know, in my generation, not just from my particular hood, but from any hood, blood or crip, Los Angeles, San Bernardino County, Orange County, uh, wherever. Killing a homie was something that was definitely a tremendous no-no and you would be ostracized from the hood if not killed your, your damn self, you know. Well, now, some of these younger gangs, they thought it was cool to get into it and kill one of their homies. You know, they had no problems, you know, being scandalous, robbing their own homie. And so, they, I, they ideology on being in the streets was extremely different from mine and it was starting to show in a lot of their actions when they come to prison. The bad part about when you come to prison, though, and you run with a collective... Unfortunately, you are responsible for those you are responsible for the actions of those with inside your collection. Like I told y'all, if you keep current with a couple of my stories, you know, a couple of times we had some homies pull up. I was um, and, th and this story right here takes place at CMC East. I was there. I was in a position of financial security because I was selling cigarettes and I was making a large sum of money. So when we would have a homie pull up, you know, um, I would go over there to the reception cell where they had him in. I would make sure, you know, if he needed anything, whether it was cosmetics, food or whatever, I'd make sure he had all that stuff. Now, I've been at other p prisons where. We kept a special kitty for this type of thing. You know, all the homies that would go to the store once a month, they might give up a toothpaste or a few soups or deodorant just to supply the homies who pulled up 
and didn't have anything because when you first come from another prison your property is on a bus and it may not get there for another week a week or two and so you need certain little things to tide you over right and so uh um, a couple of times homies would pull up, you know, they'd be from the Inland Empire, geographically speaking. They, you know, get to the yard, say they're, they're programming with the homies from the Inland Empire. Then an incident would happen. And then all of a sudden they'd be nowhere to be found. And they changed their mind. You know, I went to the hole one time behind a riot. I come back. One homie come handing me the stuff back talking about, you know, he did some buster stuff and he's not going to ride with the car. Another one of the homies had turned bloods and was running with the bloods. And so for situations like this. It uh, made me decide, okay, it was time to step away from the homies in that aspect because me being a lifer, um, I was trying to, uh, uh, at that point in time, obtain my freedom. And I didn't have the luxury of getting in trouble behind these knuckleheads who was only there for a year or two stay on the yard doing drugs, this and that. You know, A lot of people ask, well, hey, chill, why didn't you go discipline the dude that was said, I'm going, I'm going? Well, you know, to me, it wasn't even worth it because at that point, like I said, I'm starting to see lifers who have been in prison for 25, 30 years and who had caught murders in prison get paroled and go home. You know, um, when I first came to prison, if you had life with the possibility of parole, it still pretty much was a life without the possibility of parole sentence due to the fact that the governor was denying everybody. So anyway, uh, one of those dudes who had who doesn't have life, they can get into a fight. They might get found guilty when they go to the hearing and they get 90 days loss of credit. They stay out of trouble for maybe 90 days or six months. I forget the exact amount of time it was now, but they can file what's known as a restoration for credit uh, paper. And they would get their time back if they stayed out of trouble. Whereas opposed as a lifer, when you would go to the board, they would say, well, hey, you know what? You got into a fight two months ago. You got into a fight three years ago. So now I'm going to give you a five-year or a seven-year denial. Because as a lifer who's in for a violent crime, they expect you to bring five years disciplinary free. So um, in order to, for me to try to uh, reach all those type of things, I felt it was best for me to stop associating myself with these young, wild youngsters, you know, now. It was a few homies there like G-Funk. Um, G-Funk was from, um, damn. Uh, uh, G-Funk was from, from I can't remember right now, but if you know G-Funk, everybody know where G-Funk is from. Uh, of course, I wouldn't let G-Funk know. If you get, into some, you get into some trouble, homie, of course, I got your back. I'm right here on trip. The homie SP from 18th Street. 18th Street is a black gang in San Bernardino. Um, not the Hispanic game. You know, I've let him know, hey, homie, you get into it, you already know. You know, I'm there with you. My boy Wack from Gateway and a few others. But for as far as these youngsters, homie, I'm not having these dudes back. So anyway, I said all that to uh, hop into this story right here. So now, uh, one day I'm out there chilling. Somebody tell me, hey, chill, we got a homie. Now, this is before, this is before I had stepped away, though. Somebody said, hey, chill, we got a homie over there in the reception building. So now when I go to the reception building, the reception building is a line of uh, of cells. And they got like a screen on, over the window so they can see out, but we can't see in. So now as I'm talking to one of the homies up in there by the name of Double R from Colton City Crip, I'm asking him, what's up, homie? Uh, You know, where you coming from? I forget exactly where he told me he was coming from, but he said he had went to the hole for um basically dpn somebody that had got out of line that had done something that had stole something something along those lines i can't remember exactly what it was so now he has to stay up in that in that um that tank that he's in that uh initial tank for maybe about an hour i mean excuse me maybe about 24 hours 48 hours before he can before he's released to come to the yard so now i go back over there periodically i'm talking to him because i got a good i got a good homie from Colton City Crip, who ended up passing away, unfortunately, in prison by the name of T-Roll. A hey, much love to you, T-Roll. Rest in peace. That was a real good dude, man. I don't think I ran across too many people who knew T-Roll and didn't like T-Roll. T-Roll was a great dude. So him and T-Roll are immediate homies. And so we talking and stuff. At that time, T-Roll had been at that prison, but by then he had left and moved. So anyway, me and this dude is talking. I'm making sure he's straight. Also, at this particular prison, they got a snack bar. You know, they got sodas, ice cream, potato chips. So, of course, I asked Double R if he needed anything. Um, uh, he, You know, he wanted a soda or something or whatever it was, ice cream. I sent it into the building, made sure he got it. So, when he comes out the building... 
Then I'm looking at him and I see, okay, well, damn, this dude looks like he's in his late 40s to early 50s. So I asked him, damn, homie, how old are you? I think he told me he was like 52, 53, somewhere up in there. And I was kind of surprised because in the course of our conversation, by him telling me that he had went to the hole for DP and one of the homies, I just automatically assumed that he was a young dude because that's the type of stuff that youngsters get caught up in you know at the age of 49 50 in your 50s you really shouldn't be going to the whole deep in no young homie for stealing if there's only unless you're the only you know you're you're one of the only homies on the yard you know but if they got 15 20 homies by at by at by that age you should have been got that out your system in terms of you should have already put your work in and that should that task should be relegated to one of these youngsters so that's something that made me you know, made me like, dang, okay, what's up with this dude? But anyway, so, you know, we go to talk and we chop it up. We build a rapport. We build a relationship, you know, uh, due to the fact that, of course, he was older at that time. I was in my mid-40s, you know, and at that time, I believe he was on three strikes. You know, he had been to, the, he had been to prison back and forth pretty much since he was about 18, 19, 20. So he definitely knew the rules of prison life and so on and so forth, right? And so, fast forward maybe about a year, year and a half later, we got another young homie that pulls up, man. This young homie was named Trig, man, from Paris Lokes. Now, Trig at the time was about 18, 19 years old, man. Trig was a young wildcat, man. He always was in trouble, always, you know, just getting into it. Not necessarily um, bad trouble where he should have been DP'd about, just mischievous type stuff, you know, he, he didn't want to lock it up, you know, the, uh, the police would always be announcing his real name over the speaker, hey man, come lock it up, come lock it up, they'd be calling out his name, you know, the dude was into all types of stuff, you know, as a hard-headed, wild youngster his age would be, you know what I'm saying, the dude is a gang member, he's not listening to the police, okay, fine, you know, um, now, also on the yard, there was another dude also from Colton City Crip by the name of Trouble. Now, I mentioned Trouble in a story maybe about a year ago, and it has come to my attention that there are two Troubles from Colton City Crip. One big old giant tall one. I'm talking about the one that's maybe about 5'8", maybe about 160. So it's not the big tall one. It's this other one, right? And so anyway, Trouble, Trouble had, uh, man, Trouble was... One of the reasons, not him per se, but his attitude was one of the reasons why I eventually chose to step away from the IE car because, you know, he was in there doing slick stuff. He was, um, you know, would rent, would rent phone time from people, give them fake green dot numbers. You know, I don't know if you guys are familiar. A green dot is somewhat like a prepaid credit card that has the numbers on it. You'll give it to somebody they could, uh, that people could get the money off there. You know, well, he, he would give these people credit card numbers that had already been used, fake credit card numbers, and it was just creating a problem. Matter of fact, beep, boop, pop, beep, pop. The homie Whack from Gateway had went out there and put hands on him one time for, for some of the bullshit he was down there doing, you know. And so, um, he, you know, he was, he was scandalous to say the, he was scandalous to say the least, right? So now at one point in time, Trub, who was probably in his early, who was early in his early twenties. And due to the fact that he also was from Colton City Crip, initially when he pulled up, you know, I took a liking to him. I'm trying to talk to him, trying to lace him just out of the love that I had for my homie t Row, you know, Maurice Tansy, because I already know that t Row would do the same thing if he was at another pen uh, with somebody from my from my um my hood from Bannon, you know, some so T Row would definitely try to lace them and take them under the wing if they was a new youngster just because of his relationship with me. And so I was trying to do, of course, what any real good homie would do. And so, but like I said, for whatever reason, I just seen that it wasn't working with, with Trub. You know, I mean, some of these youngsters are caught up in their ways, and he was caught up in just trying to be slick, getting over the best way that he could. You know, people like to do drugs in there, weed, uh, meth, all types of crazy shit, you know. So, anyway, at some point in time, Trub and Trig end up being sellies. Uh, I don't know how long they were sellies for, maybe a couple months, but for whatever reason, um, Trouble end up moving out. Now, like I said, Trig was a good dude. He was kind of young. He was wild. He liked to run around and gamble, do a lot of stuff. He didn't do a lot of stuff that would cause animosity between our car and um, 
somebody else's car. He just done young stuff that was, you know, that wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't good to do time. You know, he loved to gamble. Now he would always pay his debt. So one particular time he called me out on the basketball court. He wanted to gamble. Um, long story short, we gambled. I took all this stuff. He had just got a package. I beat him out of about a hundred dollars. So what I did is I kept all this. He, he went in there. He got me everything from the package that he owed me. I kept his stuff for about two or three days. Then I said, hey, homie, here, I'm going to give you your stuff back, homie. Stop gambling. Everybody's not going to return your stuff. Even though I know had he beat me, he wouldn't have gave my stuff back. But that's neither here nor there. You know what I'm saying? Uh, at that point in time, like I said, I was in my I was in my mid 40s, you know, and I was trying to teach this dude a lesson. Um, I gave him all his stuff back. He was so happy. But of course, a day or two later, he's right back to gambling again with somebody else. So anyway. Um, Trub ends up moving up out of the cell. Now, once again, this is after me and me and me and Trig had gambled. You know, this is maybe two or three months later. Trig had got another package. So now in at CMC East, we have keys to the cell. So I don't know if when Trub moved out, maybe Trub had kept a key or whatever. So now as me and Trig is outside again, we're playing basketball, but this time we're playing teams or whatever. You know, we out there chilling, just having fun. When he goes back to his cell, he sees that somebody has just went in there and stole all his stuff. Now, the day before uh, Trub had moved out, Trig had got a package. So, of course, when Trig go to the cell, sees that somebody has robbed him, stole all his stuff. Trig is extremely hot. He's upset. You know what I'm saying? He's mad. He's trying to find out who went in his cell and stole all this stuff, which is extremely disrespectful um, in prison, especially in California. Now, if you just go up to somebody, you know, while that dude is chilling in his cell, you go up in there and say, hey, homie, uh, let me holler at you. Hey, I need this stuff. And you take his stuff, that's between you and him. You know what I'm saying? But um, a person being a thief is something that is frowned upon heavenly uh, in prison. And so anyway, uh, now the way that the way that the CMC East cells are built, or, or excuse me, is set up. It's like one long hallway. It reminds me of a college, a college uh, uh, dormitory. And the hallway might be about seven or eight feet, and it's cells on each side. And so I said all that to say it's, it's, extremely, it's extremely crowded down there. And so, of course, somebody happened to witness Trub go in uh, Trig's cell and take all this stuff. Now, that's another thing, you know, that was in, in my generation. Like I said, you didn't have you didn't have people harbor thieves. You know, in this younger generation, you had some people believe, OK, man, I'm not in here for telling. You know, I ain't, I ain't in here for telling. Um, but when you letting somebody else know who the thief is and, and, and you're not informing the police, that's not considered a form of telling. Right. But still in all, some people have the right to choose not to get involved, you know, especially if they're from another car. They don't want to get involved. Maybe the person they may say, hey, uh, uh, Trig, I seen who went who went in your cell. And then that person come back and want to confront them. So, of course, you know, but like I said, in my generation, we immediately, hey, man, that ain't right. Uh, it was such and such. So uh, in the course of this investigation or whatever, um, Trub finds out, you know, uh, uh, or excuse me, Trig finds out that Trub went in his cell maybe about three or four days after he initially went in it. But now, so when, when Trig comes back outside and tells me that somebody stole all this stuff, I'm immediately hot. You know what I'm saying? Now, the homie Trig, was, yeah, he was he was pushing IE2. But now, like I said, I had back at that point. This is after the homie YG said, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. And so at that point, I had backed away. You know what I'm saying? But when he come tell me this, I get extremely upset. You know what I'm saying? So now I'm on the I'm on the uh I'm on the campaign trail with him to try to find out who has stole his stuff, right? So uh I go over there to, you know, the homies from IE. And uh, I'm trying to figure out what's going on and this and that. Now, at some point in time, I remember YG saying, hey, chill. Well, you know, what you got to do with it? You said uh, you said you wouldn't push him with the homies no more. Um, I said, well, hell, homie. I said, hey, homie, well, listen, this is my homie right here, man. And I'm trying to figure out who, who got his stuff down, what you talking about, right? So now I go get that double R, right? Double R, of course, is the big older homie of Trub. And so I'm trying to figure out, hey man, yeah, you know, somebody stole the homie stuff. It's foul. Now these dudes is playing dumb, acting like they don't know initially. 
I remember at some point in time, maybe a day or two later, me and Double R, we walking and talking about it. Double R tells me, hey, well, you know what, chill? I think that uh, whoever, whoever, whoever has his bag should just give it back and that should be the end of it. You know, because I... I'm I'm calling for this dude to be disciplined, this dude to be bebop, boobopped and put up off the yard and all all types of stuff. So his response really shocked me considering how old he was and all the time he had done in prison. He knew that wasn't the rules to dealing with someone who's going to go in somebody's cell and steal something. But later on, I found out, of course, why he gave me that response. So maybe about two or three days later. It's another young homie who had pulled up there. And I forget exactly where this dude was from. Dude probably was 19, 20 years old, light-skinned dude. I can't even, I don't even remember the dude's name, man. Okay, sorry if I pause right there. Somebody had called my phone. I don't know if, if, it, if it stopped or whatever. But anyway, some, light, some young light-skinned dude had, was also on the yard. You know, I don't remember his name, and I don't remember where he was from. But for the purposes of, for the purposes of this story, I'm going to call him Shaggy. And you guys will see why a little later on. But so, yeah, all of a sudden now, Trig comes, and he gets at me, right? And Trig tells me, hey, man, Shaggy is the one that went in my cell and stole all my stuff. So now, when he tell me that, I said, man, are you sure? Because, you know, I had talked to Shaggy when before a couple of times, you know, when when anybody from, from IE came to prison, and especially when they was young and they first time, I would try to, you know, walk some laps with them, talk to them, you know, of course, see if they need anything, try to see where their mind was at, and also try to get them prepared for doing time, letting them know that certain things was not expected of them, certain things what were, were, was expected of them, you know what I'm saying? And so in my course of talking to Shaggy, I just didn't get the feeling that Shaggy was that type of person. Matter of fact, Shaggy didn't even gang bang. He was from the Inland Empire area, but he was not a gang member, right? And so I was just really, I just didn't, did, didn't get that feeling that he had went in that cell and stole that stuff, right? So uh, I asked Trig, man, once again. I said, Trig, are you sure? You know, Trig said, yeah, man. He, you know, he said he stole the stuff. I said, man, man. I said, well, whoop that motherfucker's ass then. He said, yeah, man, we finna go down here and catch this fade, you know. And so um, at some point, they went down to Shaggy's cell, I believe it was, which was in the second building on the first tier. Now, I'm mad. I'm hot as fish grease, right? So I take my glasses off and I slide down there. The reason I took my glasses off because I didn't live on that tier. And so I didn't want the um, the guard who was sitting there to try to recognize me. A lot of people tell me I look very different without my glasses. So anyway, I go down there. Now, the tier that Shaggy happens to live in, um, fortunately, was way at the back. You know, I think it's like maybe um, the sale starts at zero, zero, and they go all the way down to maybe like 26 or something. Then they come back up on the other side, 27, 28, and it comes back to like 50. So anyway, uh. Trig and Shaggy go up in the cell, and I'm standing there at the door watching while they go up into the squad, right? I'm like I say, I'm hot as fish grease, you know, because one thing that really uh burns me up is a jailhouse thief. So I'm at the door and I'm telling Trig, whoop that motherfucker's ass, whoop that motherfucker's ass. Now the whole time they walking down there, like I say, Shaggy, his demeanor is, you know, he is, is very is very humble. He's very meek. You know, I just don't get the feeling that this dude has done this stuff. But if he want to say he done it, then I'm telling Trig whoop this dude's ass, right? So once they get up in the cell, Shaggy goes to the back of the cell and turns facing the door. Trig goes in second, you know, and the cell is only maybe about, maybe about eight feet. It's not, it's not, it's not that long at all. Maybe eight feet long, maybe about four or five feet wide. You know, it's an extremely small cell. So when they get up in the cell, boop, pop, beep, boop, they go to squab it, boop, boop, boop. You know, Shaggy go to fight and Shaggy go to swimming like my, Mike, Michael Phelps with his head all down. You know, Trig, I'm like, Trig, get him, get on him. Trig is on him. Boop, boop, pop, pop, pop. You know, Trig get a couple good ones in. Shaggy all of a sudden stand up and he holler, it wasn't me. And I, I'm like, Trig, get him, get him. You know, so they, they go at it again. Boop, pop. Trig is on him. Shaggy once again say, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Now, me being behind the action and I'm outside the cell and the door is closed. I can't quite hear what he's saying. So all of a sudden they back up and they stop. 
And I'm telling Trig, get him, get him, get him. Trig like, no, man, no, he cool. I'm like, man, get him, get him, get him. You know, so I'm like, open the door, let me up in there. Because now I want to go up in there and put the mix on him since, since Trig ain't going to get him. So he t Trig turned around and say, he told me what he said, that it wasn't me, you know. And so uh, they sitting there talking, you know. I see their hands going, they talking or whatever. So long story short, what Shaggy ends up telling Trig is that Double R... And those dudes, I believe Trub had put him up to saying it was him. They was going to give him some of the package to try to alleviate the situation and keep their names in the clear, right? And so uh, they come out the cell. We end up walking, leaving the tier, of course, going back out to the yard. And uh, so now I'm, I'm looking for double R, right? I'm looking for double R trying to holler at him to see what's really going on. You know, the whole time they playing dumb. Um, long story short, it comes out that Double R, when when Trub went down there and stole the bag, he took the bag to his bigger homeboy, Double R. So when I, me and Double R is talking about trying to find out and locate who has his stuff, and remember I told you guys when, when Double R told me, hey, chill, well, I think whoever has the bag, man, they should just give it back to him. You know, he dude should just get his stuff back, and that should be it. That should be it, and that should be all. The whole time, Double R had that bag the whole time, man. And so, like I said, when I heard that, I was extremely disappointed in Double R especially because Double R was in his early 50s, and he had been down for quite some time, and of course he knew better, right? And so, like I said, you know, it's a cold situation when you're in prison, you're willing to ride, put your freedom your time, and even your life on the line for another homie. And your loyalty to him isn't the same as his loyalty to you, you know. Um, for your own homie trying to get you in prison for your stuff, knowing that it's something that your family sent you is an ugly situation, you know. And that's what happened. Um, I was seeing with a lot of cars, you know. The loyalty wasn't there um, in the later years of my doing time like it was when I first started doing time. Like I said, you had these youngsters coming to prison with different mentalities, different ideologies on doing time, and um, things was different, man, you know. So if you have a dude that's on the street, he's gangbanging on the street, and he feels it's okay and cool for him to kill one of his homies that he grew up with, uh, then how much loyalty can I expect for this dude to have towards me, an individual who, who he don't even know and he has met in prison. But if you have grew up with somebody and you have no problems about shooting them or killing them, how much loyalty can I expect up out of you, right? And so um, when I seen individuals start to practice these type of things, I realized at that point in time, man, that I had to put my freedom and um, the thoughts of coming home to those who really cared about me above hanging with these dudes, affiliating myself with these cats because I realized later on too that loyalty was actually one of my bad habits. You know, I can, uh, was one of my downfalls. Sometimes I can be extremely loyal to the wrong individuals. Um, so I don't quite remember if, if, uh, if Trey continued to function with the IE car, but I'd seen that happen before. You know, I remember I was in a uh, Chuckawalla. And there was a, a good homie who I had known since the county jail. By the, and this dude's name was Trouble, too. But this was a solid homie. Trouble, this Trouble was from Westside Rubido PJs, right? And I had I had got to Chuckawalla, and I only stayed there for about a week because it was it was a CO who worked there. And he said he was he was friends with my victims and had me move, sent to the hole and move, right? But it was, a, and I'm not even going to say this hood, right? But now, Trouble was pushing with the collective, the Inland Empire. Now, there was another homie, an older homie, well-known, reputable homie from a hood in San Bernardino. He, he has since passed away, right? And so I'm not going to say his name or whatever, right? But he was down there stealing. He was stealing from other people in Chuckawalla, which is an extreme and a huge no-no. He had homies on the yard from his, um, from his personal hood. You know, even though we're all homies, you have some people who are on the yard who are from the same hood on the street. He had homies who was from the same hood on the street. And yes, they knew he was stealing. It had been brought up, but they didn't want to deal with him due to his vicious 
reputation on the street. And of course, seeing something like that made the homie Trub want to not start, wanted to back off and not deal with the homies because favoritism was being showed and there's supposed to be no favoritism. And especially with something like that, there are rules and regulations, you know, to how how things should be conducted inside a car right and so those are the things like that 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 break down cars that break down alliances and things like that you know when you don't there is no certain allowances be made for certain individuals everybody should be held to the same standard nobody is bigger than the car but unfortunately that is not always how things go and when people see that people do not want to make themselves a part of something that's being ran um, not according to the way things should go. So anyway, yeah, that's an ugly cold situation. Uh, when you find out that it's snakes in your own car, you already know what it is. It's your boy. Oh, and the reason I called the dude Shaggy because he said it wasn't me. So anyway, y'all already know, man, it's your boy 16 to life. Resume normal program.